accountant, a native of Sweetwater, and a graduate of Texas Tech University. Please welcome the Honorable Dustin Burroughs, John Frullo, and Charles Perry. Give them a big hand. Thank you all for being here. So we're ostensibly here to talk about the legislature. I know you all were in Austin a little bit longer in total than you intended to be this year. Um, you'd rather be here, of course. Everybody would rather be home. And the pay is so great when you're in Austin to be in the legislature. Um, really, at the end of the day, the success of any session is about what you did for the people you serve. And I want to ask you first, Representative Frulo, do you believe, Chairman, that the work of this legislature, in the regular and the special, was good for this community? Did, is this community better for the work you did over those roughly six months in Austin? Sure. Um, Evan, first off, I want to thank you and Texas for you for putting on this event. It's Happy to be. Great event. Now, one thing I did note is that two folks that were up here with me last time are not up here, so I don't know what you do with them. But, well, uh, one of them is in the corner office, and that's uh, right. <laughs> the other one is up in Munster, mad that he wasn't invited to this event. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah. anyhow, thank you. And of course, uh, as you mentioned, your health. Uh, uh, Donna Corbin is my district director here, and I uh, want to uh, feel wave Donna. Uh, a lot of you have dealt with her, and yeah. I want to give her appreciation sure. for all that she does and the work sure. that she does. Uh, as far as the last legislative sessions, that uh, the general. Uh, of course, then we had halftime, then we had the special session. Uh, I, I think that we did, and I personally uh, am proud of the work that we did, uh, starting off with Texas Tech uh, and working with uh, Senator Perry. We were able to, first off, get money for the veterans, I mean, the, uh, the vet school, right. and get that appropriated and meet that need that we have for this area. And it's going to be a great uh, opportunity to train uh, vets to go out and work. It'll uh, be through a collaboration of the uh, Health Science Center okay. and also with the city of Amarillo. Uh, it'll be up in the area where we need large animal vets and pretty excited about that. We did, uh, again, working with, uh, uh, you know, of course, Dustin, too, all of us were working together. Uh, specifically, uh, Senator Perry and myself worked for a land transfer to help veterans out where we could have land uh, transferred uh, and work through the uh, 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 the Texas Tech University system to provide help for the vets, a, yeah. a, a medical center where there's a lot of, uh, a, a, uh, I would say, increased capacity. Right. So, you know, from that standpoint, from the budgeting standpoint, we, we did a lot for Texas Tech. Local priorities. Local priorities. Of course, right. uh, if you want to go to statewide priorities, you look at what we did at uh, CPS and the changes that we made there. We put right. in place and see what happens there. Of course, uh, you know, overall, we balance the budget, which is something that we're, we're required to do. And the only bill, as you know, that we are required to Constitutionally pass. required to pass a budgeting balance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, I, I think uh, without taking a lot of the thunder away from the other guys, I'm very, very proud of the individual things that we did. Uh, one yeah. of the uh, items I had a lot of uh, challenges with was passing a knife bill, uh, which uh, allowed uh, people to protect themselves. And it removed a lot of... Um, so problems, I think, and ambiguity that we had in the law. People were carrying knives that they did not know were illegal. Right. They uh, There was no definition of what they are, so they couldn't find where they were illegal. Uh, law enforcement had the same issues as well as the uh, court system. So we were able to get rid of those yeah. uh, problems and, and make that. So that was kind of a, a fun little thing. Uh, also, certain items that we made as far as the... Uh, that, that I was involved in had to do with insurance issues, a lot of insurance issues, the synchronization of uh, uh, pharmaceutical fills where people could go and line up their medication so they only had to make one trip to the pharmacy. That's uh, huge, especially if you have a hard time getting out of your area. Yeah, uh, That's something that helped folks around. So here. this is a good list of things that you went in hoping to do on behalf of the community, got accomplished, and you felt like it was a good yes, session. Yes, exactly. Senator Perry, Chairman, do you believe similarly, this good session for this community, what, what would the three or four takeaways be for you? Most so, important work done benefiting your district. No, I think I think representing 51 counties, yeah. 36 of them less than 10,000 people, it's rural. It's always about rural yeah. initiatives. Many you know, of these populations are, in these counties are absolutely. declining, right? So somebody has to pay attention to the well, issues. Rural health care, yeah. telemedicine, right. telepsychiatry for our county jails in those rural communities that yeah. have an intake issue on, is this guy crazy, does this guy need meds, or does this guy just need to be put away? So right. you had that legislation, you had telepharmacy that I authored and brought through that where these rural communities lose a pharmacist, they can now do it with a farm tech, right. with a Scott vehicle back in. So I think rural health, as always, is a challenge and an issue with the state. 
we did some really big advances on there. We funded public schools at the growth. We had about 160,000 kids in a biennium. Right. We were able to do the growth. Could we have done more? Should we have done well, more? Well, as you know, there are some people when they talk about the I session who think that public school finance was a miss and not a hit. Yeah, and I would say it this way. We came in short. Right. We carried over a cash reserve from the previous balance, right? Yeah. So we used all that up, and we were able to stay at the same base allotment for the growth. We didn't right. get to add money to it, right. but we were at the same base allotment. Uh, you know, John mentioned tech. You had a dental school in El Paso now. You've got a VA clinic. You've got the vet school. Yeah. So on that level. And, you know, uh, generally, Chairman, higher ed was looking until the end to be taking a haircut. Sure. And actually, you all pulled higher ed well, from the drink there to switch having, metaphors. Right? Having uh, too many colleges, 13 in that 51 counties, right. they uh, they got back to more equitable. They did not have a fair shake in the session prior. Right. But we made that whole this session. So actually, my community colleges, if you ask any of them, felt very good. Oh, they felt like they had a good session and a better session than they did last so, time. That's right. So, I mean, if you look at it from a rule, I have 149 school districts. Yeah. There were some things I'd like to have gotten done. Acetar was a big issue. Well, I want to come to the things you guys didn't do in a second, but that list that you gave is a pretty sure. good snapshot it's of the stuff. It's a pretty good snapshot. It's the stuff you care about. But rural health care, yeah. right. uh, competency restoration, criminal justice reforms, yeah. uh, the telepsychiatry is going to be a big issue. You know, Senator Whitmire would have a psychiatrist in every cell. That's right. just not feasible. Out in my counties, they're lucky to have one chair. Well, there are a whole bunch. Of, I think so, there's something like 80 counties in the state out of 254 that have no psychiatrist sure. in the whole county. And that's where I think those are the little initiatives that people discount how big they're going to be. But it actually has a big they're impact. They're going to be huge. Would you, Representative Burroughs, would you put school finance on the list of things that you did as opposed to didn't do this session? So the two bills that I actually filed, I mean, probably the first day you could file them or first week you could file them, was trying to extend ACETAR and eliminate the small school penalty. So my priorities were going in, was taking care of some of my smaller rural schools. Right. We didn't go as far on ACETAR as I would have hoped for, but we also put some more money in, especially during the special session, to make sure that cliff wasn't as sharp as it could have been for them to keep their doors open. Right. We're also eliminating the small school penalty over time, which is a game changer for a lot of the schools out here. Mm -hmm. It is a very good thing. Big reform. So could we have done yeah. more? Sure. There's always opportunities to have done more, but I'm very proud of the work we did do. And let's also acknowledge it was a tight budget going in. So Absolutely. you knew that you were not going to have an unlimited amount of money to spend on everything everybody wanted. Yeah. Right. Uh, gentlemen, well, list is CPS. You know, I was on county affairs with Chairman right. Coleman. We went to seven different locations. We heard horrible stories what were happening to children. Right. I am very proud of the multitude of bills that, you know, very engaged in making sure we're good to serve our children. I think that was a highlight of the session. Arguably, that was a big win. That was a priority of the governor. Sure. It was a priority of the legislature. It was one of the rare bipartisan issues in this legislature. Emergency right? item. I think it was right. a very good call. Right. So what else would you say was another big win that you might bring back home for this district? Texas Tech, we've talked about that. But let me yeah. tell you another thing that uh, Senator Perry and I worked on is there has been some frivolous lawsuits against our farmers. We filed a bill to try to stop farmers from getting sued unnecessarily on cotton contracts, which we saw out of 2011, okay. 2012. So anything we can do while we have these big multinational right. companies now suing our farmers to have some sort of tort reform or contract lawsuit reform is a good thing, equaling the playing field for them. Very good legislation, very pro-ag out here. I think that was a highlight of the session as well. You are three conservative members of a conservative legislature. The disposition of a conservative legislature is that a win can be defined as government not doing things. Right. I mean, in some ways, if you're just doing a, a, a plus and minus ledger, if you have a lot of things on the minus ledger, you might guys actually might consider that to be a positive. Right. So Chairman Perry, is right. that right? Yeah. Um, so it, by that measure, I mean, there were a bunch of things that you all came in hoping to do. You, school finance, we talked about. I mean, you can look at it round or square. But school choice was an effort largely out of the Senate. Didn't pass. This is the third session, I believe, where that's been a big priority, but it did not pass. Property tax reform did not make. Um, uh, the privacy bill or the bathroom bill, depending upon how you view it, one might call it one, one might call it the other, did not make. Um, talk a little bit about stuff that you feel like you wish had gotten done that did not get done this session. Well, you named two of them. Uh, property tax Which reform, two? Property Boy. tax reform and uh, the Privacy Act. Yeah. I, I really was disappointed we couldn't get those done. School vouchers, I carved out 237 out of 254 counties. Right. Uh, with that issue. I've, I've recognized. You have the lieutenant governor's ear. He's yeah, big on that. Yeah, Can't you just yeah. tell him to pull that down yeah, if you don't yeah, like it? Yeah, that's not how that works. You know no? That. Okay. So, uh, you know, if I was king for a day, maybe, but that in that in reality. You know, I tell people statewide membership has its privileges and their agenda items are their agenda items. We're a big state. Right. Diversity in our school base. 
whether that program works for them or not, I don't know, right. but I know it doesn't fit. Why well didn't you there. get property tax reform done? There's probably nobody in this room or in this state who would not like a break on their taxes. Why didn't you guys? Why got, didn't you guys get it done? I, I can tell you the Senate sent it over, and from there, I'm not. So is this going to be a blame the House? Deal, no, it's not Chairman? a blame the House. I'm just telling you. I was waiting there for was the blame the House. Of, it took five whole minutes. Let, for let, me, the House. let me rephrase it. There yeah. was bottom line. There was very good conversation, very good dialogue about what that is or isn't, and all that bill was about for me was transparency, and to give the voters a right. If a local jurisdiction wants to raise taxes, you get the right to vote for that. Right. And that's that was the that was the core. But I the fight was over the trigger the percentage, was it? It not? was over the trigger. Yeah. But I think that the discussion got mixed up in the details, and it, I don't know if you know what gorilla dust is. You throw a bunch of dirt in the air, and everybody gets mixed up, and then they leave, and there's nothing happened. To me, I think that was kind of one of those victims of gorilla yeah. dust. They just kind of enough fodder got thrown into the mix that right. nothing got done. Representative Frulo, did you back. guys did you guys kill property tax reform? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I didn't quite see yeah, it that yeah. way or, or hear it that way as far as what you said, Evan. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you get back to, yes, there were differences between the House and the Senate and how it evolved. Uh, the Senate, of course, sent the bill over. We, in the House, looked at it. Uh, there were two provisions in that bill that uh, we all, I think, wanted. One of them was to make an automatic rollback versus a petition rollback which if you've ever tried to get petitions filled out, get the right names, get it checked, it, it's very difficult to do. Oftentimes it doesn't work, okay. and, and so that fails. So that was a provision. I, I don't think there was much difference between the House and the Senate on that, that issue. Where it uh, kind of got down into the, the weeds was on the percentage. Right now, the percentage for that petition rollback is at 8%. Uh, the House changed the bill to 6%. There was a vote in the House to drop it down to 4%. I voted for that. I believe Dustin voted mm -hmm. for that. And, uh, but unfortunately, didn't we, pass. Did, yeah. it, we didn't have enough votes to get that amendment attached. The Senate wanted a lower percent. They 4%. wanted lower at 4%, right. exactly. Right. So it, uh, at that point, yeah. it was sent back at 6%, the automatic yeah. uh, uh, trigger. And uh, you know, from that point, I guess politics and timing right. went on and uh, yeah. didn't make. Isn't that Representative Burles that everybody hates about politics and politicians? You're, you're mad about 8%, so you, you're choosing between 4 and 6%, and because you can't agree, it stays at 8%. Yeah, it's political theater, and I think most people don't like the political theater. The policy should stand on its own or fail on its own, and that's right. how it's voted. I think everybody up here on this stage would have voted to pass it at 4%, 4 right. and pass the bill, and I think next session will likely you'll come pass back it. And get, you'll come but back the back. other part of yeah. it was the transparency piece, and I do want to highlight that you know this was something we all agreed on, actually initiated in the House, Senate adopted it because it's a very good policy that gave a clear picture to taxpayers where the additional new money was going to actually start a dialogue right. between you know taxpayers and the local governing entities because, mind you, we don't have a statewide property tax, but to start that dialogue, good piece of legislation, should have passed, got caught up into the political theater, yep. which nobody likes. It'll pass next session, it'll, my it'll, prediction. It'll, it'll come back. Sure. But well, how, how will the politics next time be any different, Chairman Perry, than it was this time? Well, I think, one, you got two years with the constituents that are going to remind you every town hall their property tax. Hey, you didn't cut high. my property tax. Right. That's, yeah. that's going to be a recurring theme. It already is. It already was. Right. So I think you're going to see that uh, momentum build as... People are right. away for a couple of years. Right. You're going to have some interim hearings again, I believe, on some of those. And issues. you'll have some, some personnel will uh, change out of the legislature. And then right? you have some personnel changing right. out, both in Senate and in House. In, in the House. Probably more, but probably more, frankly, more in the House than more in the Senate. Uh, uh, the bathroom legislation that you said you were sorry didn't pass. You know, this is a, I don't have to tell you this, this is a controversial issue. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've never attached to controversial issues. No, no, not at all. Uh, you're going to come back and do this again? Uh, I don't know who's going to carry it, but I would suspect it's still a priority. You wanted to come back. I do. You I wanted to come back. Which bill? Because there's two versions, and right. I'd tell you, Ron Simmons' bill out of Carrollton, the House's version, you know, I signed on to, which is a preemption bill, which is not quote unquote the bathroom bill. It's a preemption bill, basically saying local governing entities don't create your own protected classes. The right. state's the one who always does that. I'm supportive of that. That's bill. a wonderful it's, effort to rebrand it, but it's a bathroom bill. It's well, a different uh, bathroom but bill, it, but it's a bill. But, but is it? Because you're dealing with cities now who could, it's the Oregon Baker case, it's the Supreme Court right now. Right. 
It's also dealing with a lot of issues beyond that that the United States Supreme Court is taking up on First Amendment religious liberty issues, and so right. I think it goes beyond the bathroom bill. But you don't so, think people won't? You think people won't perceive this as a ver as essentially an effort to do the but, same thing? But that's the political theater we talked about. Sure, that's where they want to divide and have the cutting lines and the branding issue. But right. if you actually look at the one-page bill about whether or not political subdivisions should create their own protected classes. I don't see why historically they've never been able to. They shouldn't be able to do it now. And there's big implications that the U.S. Supreme Court now over it. So, so you'd be for that again? Absolutely. You'd be for that? You bet. And would you be willing to accept as a compromise? Absolutely. I can tell you in my town halls, I've done 20 since special sessions. Right. I haven't seen a single person stand up and it's okay to have co-ed locker rooms. But if people, have, but if people, it doesn't affect business though. That's right, but, the but that. Chairman, but you know, I, I've talked to a number of Republican members who say that they had not gotten a single phone call on this issue from their districts. That this issue was coming from Austin, not from their districts. Had you heard from your constituents so, on this? The reason you don't is because Tribune's not in Tohoka or Paducah. Well, we're online. And, Technically, and when, we are. When I you, mean, well, have you had broadband out there? We're working on that. Too. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, some of these people. God, if it, if it we, was just, right. just was in Tahoka, everything we, would be better. We just, That's exactly we just right. put money in for broadband. But my point right. is, yeah. when they find out that urban ISDs are now currently okay with co-ed locker rooms, it don't go well. Right. So it's not the fact that they don't care; it's the fact they don't know. And when they figure it out, they're like, "How could that be happening?" Right. So, so you all are in, you all are in, and you all are in sync again. The, the other point I have heard, whenever the original mandate came down from the last administration right. that we were going to teach all of the children in school that there was 30, 40, 50 different genders, I heard from parents and grandparents who yeah. were concerned they did not want that, that social respect, engineering you did, you did in the schools. And I agree with that, and it shouldn't be in there. Right. And that's a great point. Yeah. The, that's that's the point. The parents did not know, and that did work. Reach some of my larger anchor cities, Lubbock, and those people. And the homeschool yeah. would come to us and say, "This is what's going on." Right. Uh, Representative Frulo, one of the big issues, maybe arguably the big issue that blew up the Capitol this time, we thought it might be the bathroom legislation. It turned out to be sanctuary cities. Now, this was actually something that this legislature was, generally speaking, supportive of previously, um, but it caused a bunch of fuss when the bill uh, came up. Ultimately, was passed, signed by the governor, goes into law. It is part of a larger conversation about immigration, which when we do polling, we see that immigration typically, border security, this whole bucket of issues ranks near the top of the concerns that people have, not just along the border, but all over the state. What do you, what do you think about this issue from the legislature's perspective this session, and where are we heading with this issue next? Well, I think that, uh, you know, if you go back to 2011, when Charles and I both came in, Sanctuary Cities was up at that point. I yes. sat on state affairs. When it went through, when Burt's bill went through the House. Not a new issue. Not a new issue. Pretty much uh, very similar to the language that we passed this last session. I think right. it's important. Uh, we don't want uh, municipalities or other organiz uh, you know, uh, subdivisions of the state being able to make, pick and choose the laws that they want to follow. They need to follow the rule of the law. Rule of law. And so w with that said, of course, Charles was the, the, the author of that bill. Yes. Um, it went through, it passed in the House, it passed in the, the Senate, and went on, as you said, to be signed by the governor and become law. I think also if you look at border security, which you mentioned, you put that together with immigration, you look at what we're facing. We as a state, uh, the folks out here in this audience, are paying their tax dollars twice, once to the federal government, who should be doing the job and right. are not, and then at the state level. The, the first year, first session I came in, we were roughly about $200 million that we paid in border security. Two years later, we were at $430 million. The last two years, we have put $800 right. million of your dollars, your Texas dollars, into border security. It's a federal uh, right. problem, or a federal issue, but a state problem. So and, we have to and, take care of it. But to that point, I understand that the argument in the last session, 15, was the Obama administration is not doing an adequate job on border security, so we have to step up. And it is our hope that we'll elect one of our guys to the White House so that he can fix this problem and we can stop spending the $800 million. So then you guys elected one of your guys to the White House last November, and I thought, isn't okay. Our guy? Huh? Isn't our guy? Our, our no, guy no, 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 or OUR guy, okay, whichever. Okay. But in any case, <laughs> you, you elected a president and an administration that was more sympathetic on this issue to the position that you had, and we all thought, well, maybe in this budget then, you won't spend eight hundred million on border security, but then what'd you do? You went and spent eight hundred million again on border security. 
So how come we didn't see a solution to the problem if you changed out the president? I liken it to this. We go over to many Middle East countries and yeah. we have a war and then we pull out and create a void and something fills in. Right. So during session at May 31st, we were hoping to have clarity as to what a federal immigration slash border security program would look like. Don't have it yet. We don't have it. Yeah. So Still we hopeful, were faced then. with, do you continue to right. fund it knowing what we're doing is working? Right. Or do you pull that money back and then have a void created that will need to be back? So we may be, Chairman, on a two-year delay. In I other words, it may be possibly, a 19. We possibly will see some relief in the Finance Committee and Senate right. have discussed that if we get a breather, breather or a break, we will reallocate the dollars, but not until we know. Right. Now, the flip side of that is, if we're doing it for them, will they ever do it for us? And if you all don't cut them uh, off, they may so, think, well, Texas but, but has got us, we don't need to do anything. I think better. it's just a matter of, right. of time. Right. The feds don't work as fast as Texas does. Right. I know that's a shock. Yeah. So, uh, if they work at all sometimes, but that was the reason we continued to fund yeah. it, because we didn't want to create the void that we have spent over $3 billion, right. I think, the last 10 years probably. Right. Um, you know, the, uh, Representative Burroughs, the, these issues, these federal immigration-related policy issues, there are many of them, but there are two in particular that are on everybody's minds right now. I want to ask you and the other uh, okay. elected officials here about them. Border wall, for it or against it? For. For? I, I think it, depending on what it is, I'm for it. We need well, do you have wall. any sense of what it is? Because I don't, I, I don't no. know what it is right now. We've heard everything from building a complete wall to have electronic portions. But, uh, yeah, we need some kind of border. We can't truly be a nation until we can secure our borders. So you're for a wall yes. with details to be determined. The chairman? Selected hard, hardened infrastructure Yeah. combined with the technology that we've already got on So here. real wall plus virtual because wall. Because here's the bottom line. Right. I've got livestock concerns. I've got private property concerns. Right. I've got a whole lot of things to answer, but the physical hard wall from 1,200 miles across is a realistic. So we've already done probably the bulk of it. The Fed would do well to just give us a check for what we've got in place because you can't step on our side without really being noticed out through cameras, surveillances, drones, all right. of that technology. Is there some areas where physical walls make sense for sure? I'll tell you what the most practical thing is. Get rid of the cane. We started an initiative burning the cane, or not burning, but removing the cane 100 yards in so that when they hit the, the, the border, you can see them. And so we started that initially, finally found a chemical that was EPA friendly that could do that. So that in itself is, is already had an effect on right. it. And it's even on the other side. Yeah. The other side has begun to right. remove it. So on immigration enforcement, Chairman Perry, what about the DACA issue? Okay. Uh, would you like to see young people who are here without documentation through no fault of their own? Sure. Would you like to see them removed as the president has suggested he may want to do? That's federal. So you're going to turf it? You're <laughs> no. going to you're so here, going to punt? You're, you're going to ask me my position on that. I am. So, I just my, did. Bottom line, here's the deal. Yeah. Our feds have woefully ina inadequate on dealing with our immigration. Yeah. If you break down the 11 or 12 million that are in it, you know, a lot of those are visas. A lot of those are bad In guys. fact, a lot of them are visa overstays, yeah, right? Yeah. Overstays. So yeah. fix that issue. Higher percentage than so you, some people you knock, think. You knock that part down. Right. Then you look at the, about the three to three and a half million that are behind bars. I, for one, don't want really. Texas has about, last time I checked, around 12,000 yeah. undocumented in their bars. And those are people you don't want out next to your daughter, so to speak. So I'm okay with keeping those guys locked up because I know where they're going to be by now. Right. So you narrow the population down, and the DACA kids probably fall into that. So Texas because has the parents. second highest percentage of DACA so, kids so or DACA eligible residents of any state in the country. The it's an level, issue for us. At the federal level, yeah. they've never said, here's a drop dead day. We put in the resources. We figure that if you follow the system like anybody else does it legally, it takes 7.3 years, whatever that number is. And on that day, if you're here afterwards and have not became part of the system, got into the network, we're going to remove you. Yeah. So I think that's one. You start with the parents at that level. The DACA kids, they are going to be part of that overall immigration reform package yeah. that needs to happen. But do I think you need to knock on doors and drag kids out and send them home? Yeah. That the only place they've ever known is 18 years in this. You know, my daughter graduated with those kids. Right. And they didn't know anything. Right. So, Surely so you've you know, got you some DACA eligible kids in this no. part of the state, probably in your district. This is where I'd put it, right? Yeah. If it's the law, they need to follow the law and obey the law. If they want to change the law at the federal level, that's why we elect federal people to figure out if they want to do something different. I'll tell you on immigration, which I'm not, you know, making big immigration policy in D.C., but, I mean, we do look at family reunification as far as the percentage of what we do with immigration versus all of the rest of the first world countries, and we overemphasize it based versus what we're actually attracting of those who can actually 
uh, pay for themselves rather than us paying for them. So, you know, let our congressmen deal with that. I think that they'll come up with a reasonable solution. But if DACA is the law, they need to uh, follow it. Same. And the rule of law, we've got to follow it. And we've got to, you know, it, it, we've right. gotten to the point that we are because the federal government has not done their job. And they've got to start doing their job. Enforcing, yeah. enforcing the law. Um, the narrative through line, gentlemen, in this legislative session was local control. There were any number of issues on which the city and the states were uh, state were in conflict. Who gets to decide? I'm old enough to remember when local control meant the locals controlled things. At at the at the moment, that may not always be the issue, right, Representative Burris? Well, you know, this is interesting because I see, you know, I hear this local control buzzword over and over and over again from some of the lobby groups out there. But let's look at some of the local issues that we're dealing with. On we have local cities who want to have their entire drilling policy banning fracking. When in the world did cities actually have try to have their own railroad commission? Never before, but because right. environmentalists got involved, they then created this. We had to go back through and say, "Sorry, guys, we've already done this." Banking, we, you know, since 1960, you know, under Democrat leadership, we decided to unify and have one banking system. Our right. bankers are happy about having a statewide banking system, but yet there are some cities who want to go out there and put a surcharge on ATMs or do things and basically have their own independent banking commissions for each and every city rather than the state level. So I look at this in some ways as you have these new socially conscious, more left-leaning ideas. They can't get their agenda through in Austin, so what do they do? They go to city councils and they go to mayors and they say, hey, look, you know, for environmental reasons or for, you know, these social reasons, let's put them through at the city level. And, of course, we look at it and say, this is bad. Texas has always been the one who sets the standard on here, and we need to right-size where government is. I'm listening to Representative Frugal. I'm listening to Representative Burroughs, and it makes me think that the com county commissioners and mayor and council members in Lubbock are a bunch of communists. <laughs> and that <laughs> I, I, I realize I haven't been here for 18 months, but I don't think that this community has changed that much. I mean, the fact is the local officials in these communities are presumably as conservative as the people they represent. Yeah. So why, So what, what's going on here? Well, I think first off, as you mentioned earlier, we're having an election coming up, and there will probably be some of that said during that election right. process. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, part of it is that, you know, ultimately local control happens at the ballot box. People determine who they want running. You're not happy with your mayor or council member. You've got an opportunity to change them out. It, exactly. Right. And I think uh, what I've looked at, you know, getting back to the knife bill, some of those items, what we yeah. saw with Uber or the ride share, the Lyft programs uh, this last session, uh, texting, again, we saw that, is what can we as individuals expect? Uh, if you, going back to a knife bill that I passed last session, not this one, but the 84th, uh, if you had that same pocket knife that your grandfather gave you 30 years ago and you happen to go to a different city than you've been in, because of their restrictive laws, you could be a criminal. So this is the patchwork and, of inconsistent regulations argument, better to standardize everything, right? right? I, I think in some cases that's important. If, if you're in a situation where you want to know what that rule is or you can expect that rule in addition to what Dustin had said, right. that we, we should be able to expect that. We should be able yeah. to have that available. Chairman Perry, you know there's this old uh, notion attributed to Jefferson that government is best when it's closest to those governed. That's really the foundation of local control is that the county commissioners and the mayors and the council members are on the ground with the people they represent and they understand better the way that the community wants to be governed than 150 people in Austin some of whom are from this community, but the majority of whom are not. What's the pushback against that? So the general principle, I think everybody would agree, and I subscribe to that too, but here's the deal. The state of Texas doesn't pay or collect a dime as property tax, but we create the regulatory or the statute in which property tax exists. Yes. So when people are irate about property taxes, they have an option at the box at the local level. They've chose not to use that, in my opinion. Right. So they came to the state and said, our property taxes are too high. We have situations now where our, our personnel capital, the youth of, of some of these big urban cities, do not find living places because it's too expensive. Too expensive, property. right. Yes. So now you're losing your youth out of some of your urban areas. So the overall public policy is, is can we have a Harris County or a Dallas County or a Bear County that doesn't have a personnel capital because nobody can stay there in that area. But, so you start yeah. losing. So there's public right. but, policy. But the problems. pushback against the pushback that is that Lubbock is, County and Harris County yeah. are not the same. And, Otherwise, know, people who live in Lubbock would live in Harris County. Yeah, They choose I, to live here because it's different. And are you trying to standardize, cookie cutter it for Lubbock County and Harris I County? I carved out 37 of, or 38, or no, I'm sorry, 48 of my 51 counties with right. 25 million or under or 20 million and under. Because there is a difference. There is a difference on rural. Now, Lubbock's not rural. It's, it's 250, it's top 
10, 11, it's 50. It's rural -er. rural -er. values wise Values-wise, it's rural, but right. budget-wise, it's different. Yeah. So, so we as a state were drug into this based on the fact that we're the only ones that can change it right. statutorily. Right. And the only thing in there that really gave me a heartburn with the debate that was ongoing was is the petition requirement. Yeah. That you should not have a barrier between a taxpayer and a taxing jurisdiction to argue or have a dialogue as to why you're raising my taxes. I have all the confidence in the world that when my county commissioners or city council or school board can say, we're raising your taxes because of ABC, that most of my voter grace is going to say, fine, I understand it, I get it. But to have a petition requirement that's basically unintendable, you can't get there. It feels like an, un an onerous burden. I think right. last time I checked, taxation without representation, so to speak, yeah, you know, yeah. you, you lost your disconnect with your, your jurisdiction. So that was the aspect of that bill's important. I carved out the twenty million. I got a lot of heat from it. You right. can imagine. But I guess I guess my, my last question on this, yeah. Chairman Perry, is if you feel the need, we've mentioned a couple of different carve outs. If you feel the need on every piece of legislation or many to carve out the rural counties, doesn't that prove the point that you can't standardize this stuff at the state? You level? can't standardize. I, I have no disagreement with that. Yeah. My 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 district is totally different. Than everybody. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so I've waited until the last uh, period here to talk about the elections. I wish we could have just talked about election season the whole time, but I wanted to get the substantive <laughs> stuff out of the way so I didn't look too shallow. Uh, <laughs> Representative Burroughs, you're running for re-election. I am. Representative Freeland, you're running for re-election. You bet. Otherwise, why would I be here? You would not. <laughs> Boy, Good answer. Boy, is that Good answer. the rightest answer I've ever heard. Why would you put yourself through that? <laughs> I'm very uh, fond of you, Evan. But, uh, not that fond, not though, that I understand. Fond, exactly. um, Senator Perry, you have the good fortune not to be on the ballot this time. Correct. Right. You want to endorse these two guys in their primaries while you're sitting right Absolutely. here? You will? You endorse them. 100%. Either one of You understand that, at least in Burroughs' case, but possibly in Frulo's case, there are people who go, we maybe ought to run at them from the right or run at them from the left. You're happy with these two in office. It's not, uh, it's not anything to do with the politics of the day. These guys work hard. They're engaged, and they're in leadership. So you're good with that. Peers. You're absolutely good with that. Um, so uh, my question to, to first to Frulo and to Burroughs is, um, once you get reelected, let's assume you do, you're going to have to decide on who you vote for for speaker. We had this uh, unexpected uh, deal in the last um, in the last week where the Speaker of the House, Joe Strauss, announced to everyone's surprise that he was not running. I think even to the surprise of his fellow Republican members that he was not going to run for re-election and therefore would not be running for speaker next time. We have the first open speaker's race in 25 years or more. Um, Wild West. Uh, uh, environment. We'll have 10 or 11 people running before this is over, I predict, and I want to ask each of you to tell me what, what or who should the next speaker be, Representative Burroughs, because I know that it matters to this community sure. as it matters to other communities. I want somebody who, you know, is willing to listen to conservative ideas. Let me tell you what I mean by that is we have lots of problems and challenges facing Texas. A lot of us can agree what those challenges are, whether it's health care, whether it's school finance, whether it's property tax, and I want a speaker who's going to say, all right, guys, let's see if we can't go look for a solution that doesn't run at it with a, a taxpayer checkbook to try to beat it over the head. You believe that was, was that speaker strategy? No, I'm not saying that at all. What yeah. I'm saying is I want to have somebody who ideological is interested in the same things I am, but also regionally understands the concerns of West Texas, who's going to be open, who's going to let me work, right. who is going to basically value the opinion and input that I put into the process. And those are the type of things I'm going to be looking for. Define conservative for me. I, I just, used to think I understood what conservative meant. Now I'm not so sure. But I, I think I just did, right? I mean, I said we have the same set of problems no matter where you are on the spectrum. Right. And the conservative definition I have is let's go look under every little place that we can to figure out if we can fix this without taking the taxpayer's checkbook out and trying to beat it over the head with that. Right. Is there a way to fix it without spending taxpayer money first and trying to go through and exhaust those remedies before you get to spending more money? You uh, put out a statement when Speaker Strauss uh, uh, said he was not going to run again that you w wanted to support a conservative West Texan. So anybody from West Texas who runs, you're going to be for him. What I just told you is I want somebody who is going to understand. I, I, know, your, I, I know your parents are here, yeah. but I'm not going to let you get away with that. Yeah. It's a yes or no question. I, look, we're going to have a process. You started it. Yeah, I know. I know. But we're going to have a process in place, and I think there's a good chance we're going to have a speaker from West Texas next time. Do you have a name? Does it rhyme with Fort Price? They, nobody, has, nobody has filed yet, and I'm not going to use any other member's name until they call and visit okay. with me. Representative Frulo, who, who or what is your next speaker? Well, I think that, uh, you know, first and foremost, as uh, Dustin said, it's going to be a conservative speaker. We want a conservative speaker. 
by that, somebody that's going to keep taxes low, uh, that is going to uh, make sure that there's less regulation and make the state a better off place. But more importantly uh, than the whole state, I'm concerned with Lubbock. I'm concerned with Texas Tech. I want a speaker that will, you know, continue to take care of Texas Tech, make sure that uh, they are able to educate and continue to grow right. in stature. The Tier 1 status that uh, we received is great. We want to make sure that happens. But what does that mean, somebody will take care of Tech? Can somebody from Richmond or Weatherford or, say, Fort Worth be a good ad? Not that I'm thinking of anybody in particular. Be an advocate? <laughs> Be an advocate for this community? I think they can be. I think, and that's what I'm looking for is who is that person going to be? Or more importantly, they're going to let us work for Texas Tech and Ag, that it's not going to be so heavy handed that we have to vote the way they say, otherwise they kick us off the team or they punish us. Was there a problem you're trying to solve with the speaker's race? I want to know how you felt about Strauss. You asking me? I am. I'm yeah. asking the two of you. So, you know, this last session, I was very complimentary of the work he did on CPS and for our schools. And I've always said, very positive things about him. Would you have been to vote for him to be speaker for a sixth term? I don't know who else was running. I mean, that's also the thing. I don't. I actually was told a lot of people I didn't think he was coming back. There was a lot of signals of it. And once yeah. the Republican caucus vote idea came up, I've obviously more and more gravitated towards. You this did vote a, for him this last. This time. is a great. I did absolutely. You. I mean, it was right, 150 right, to nothing. Right, Everybody right, voted for him. Right. Would you have voted for Strauss again? Uh, most likely, I think that he was. Uh, Leading, leading the charge, uh, you know, we were going to change this process and go right. through that, and we would see what that comes up with. You got a point you of view about this? You want to stay well, out of this? Well, exactly. Let me finish oh, yeah. that, that let me with the caucus <laughs> being able to determine this. Yeah. We went through that. Charles and I went through that in 2011. You did. Where we went through that process. We had to decide whether or not the caucus would meet. We met that uh, night, that Monday night before the Tuesday of the, uh, you know, the, the swearing in, the investiture. And uh, we came up with, with a plan, and then the next day that we went through with that. But so, my, my memory just, is that you all, came, you all agreed to get behind Speaker Strauss, and then 15 walked. Just, just so that for reference and yeah. perspective, that yeah. all does not end with the Speaker's race. Right. I was one of the 15 that voted against him. That's right. For, for no politics. <laughs> had nothing to do with politics. Had right. something to do with something different. Now I can explain to anybody that wants to hear it. Right. So I'm now in the Senate. Yeah. And the guy that was running against him that day is in the AG. So it just a matter of perspective that the right. speaker's race is important. But it's not I, the only thing. I want I want our big three to work together. And that was the loss of the last session. Right. Our big three did not connect what? and work together. Why not? Um, I mean, in that respect, Chairman Perry, I would agree with you. The big three did not work together. There's a lot yeah. of talk about how Texas has as one of the features of its politics that yeah. it's not like D.C. I thought Texas was more like D.C. during this last session than I've ever seen it. Right. And so, and so, that was at the center. So an outsider yeah. looking in, I would say they the, there were big issues. First of all, and and we have to take big issues on. I'm not I'm not uh, afraid to take those big issues on. But early on, and it was outside interest too. I would say, you know, obviously the associations against tax reform are very aggressive in their in their tactics on how they approach members, and that feeds up to leadership. And so. Right. Hold it, it was a perfect storm. I think the big issues of the day, along with just very polar opposites, I think, uh, you know, we have a, I know this is going to be a shock to you, but in the Republican Party, we got a, we got a little internal battle going of what is and what isn't. It keeps us it, in business. So, yeah. It, yeah, it does keep y'all, it, it keeps y'all interesting. But yeah. so, so all of that combined, com coupled with the big issues of the day and with strong personalities. Right. So the caucus vote so, you referred to, I forgot that you were one of the 15. So the, yeah. chair, the, the, the caucus vote in 20... <laughs> thanks, thanks for, thanks for reminding, reminding me. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. So the vote in 2011 of the caucus assumed that everybody would honor the vote of the caucus and they would all march out and vote for the we candidate didn't who was elected. in the caucus. So no. no, I don't. I don't. There, was, there was a whole lot of things going on. Chisholm was involved. So different that. from this, Dif so, so different no, from this, this is, time. This is a calculated, deliberate process. Right. So, so, so you believe, you, and you've been involved in the work group that's recommending a bylaws change in the Republican caucus, not to get too weedy here, but the fact is we're heading toward a scenario where the caucus may get behind one candidate. I want to see more party unity. Yeah. I truly do. I want to see Republicans from all spectrums within the party trying to work together and unite. Yeah. I want to see the next Republican speaker to be able to fully show that he has support of the majority of the members of the Republican caucus. I think it's very important that we actually do something like this caucus vote to do this, and I've heard nobody else come up with any alternative ideas to show party unity and to show that we're going to unite behind 
one candidate when we get there. Will it be binding? Is there, are you going to send no. people to Republican caucus jail if they decide not to honor the pledge to support this candidate? No, it can't be binding. The Constitution is very clear on that. In fact, the work group came back, and one of the first things that we said was, it is legal for us to have this selection process. It's legal for us to have this deliberation. I mean, we all know the Democrats have already had a agreement to block vote, which no one's ever asking them whether or not well, they, they can do that they, or not. They, qu they quarrel with that characterization. Well, you know, I've seen a lot of news reports from good news sources where they've come up and said they have <laughs> litmus <laughs> tests and, uh, and they've agreed to do this. And so, I, don't know, well, I don't know what news source you're talking yeah, about. But the, look, this is, this, this is one of the things. I don't want to be in a situation, yeah. you know, a year from now where a member of the Republican caucus comes in and says, guys, guess what? I've got 55 Democrats who have made a deal with me to put me in the chair. And by the way, you're going to have to vote to repeal sanctuary cities. You're going to have to be against life. You're going to have to do these things if you want to be on the team. You know, and I've got the other 20 Republicans that are going to vote with me. And I'm going to say, but, but, but they say, hey, the Hides and Carcass Committee I just formed, it's going to be one member bigger and have to deal with that. I think we should take control of it as a caucus. I think it'll be a unifying thing. I think it's a good thing. I think the majority of Republicans will end up getting behind this. And we'll find out December 1st if two-thirds don't support this, it goes away. But if they do support it, then you're going to march out of that room with one candidate. You're going to put that person up for speaker, and there are going to be no strays. Well, I hope so, and I hope we pick somebody that can do just that. That is the goal. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be someone out of the Freedom Caucus. You know, as much as they are who they are, we cannot unite behind somebody. You can't get 76 people to vote for somebody on either far end of the party. Honestly, Speaker Stickland sounds pretty good to me. I just would. John? What do you say? You want that? No? No, I'm out. I'd kind of enjoy that from a news standpoint because it's all about me. We're going to go to questions. We're going to go to questions from the audience. Please put your hand up. We'll ask that you wait for the microphone to walk around to you. If you're impatient, you can just use your outside voice. Hi. Go ahead. Ma'am. Uh, I'm Aurora Farthing. I'm a constituent here from Lubbock. And um, you guys have touched on this a little bit, but there was quite a bit of divisive rhetoric and unnecessary finger pointing in the last session. So I want to hear, and we heard a little bit from each of you about this, what you're going to do to prevent that from happening in the future and right. unify the party. Yeah, regardless of who the new speaker is, what Chairman Perry said is exactly right. The lieutenant governor and the speaker this time did not get along. They actually, there was some fussing with the governor as well. What's going to be different, Representative Burroughs, next time? Well, you know, the three of us get along, and I don't think we come back here and finger point. And, you know, regardless of any political disagreements, you don't see any of the three of us running to the paper and trying to point the finger at the other one, trying to point the finger at the other elected leaders. You know, and I think that but she's hopefully, not talking about no, you. No, 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 no. But I hopefully, hopefully that we can see more of our members take a play and take a page from what we do here in Lubbock and expand it statewide. It's better and healthier for this entire state. Hopefully this caucus vote will be a unifying thing and not a divisive so thing. So you pledge never to smack talk the Senate? I, you know what? I don't think, I can't remember a time where I've gone up there Same. and tried to take political shots at anyone. Same? I think that a lot of, exactly, there's no, we're not going to get anything accomplished by sitting there and beating up on each other. And as Dustin said, and as Charles had mentioned, we work together great. This whole region works together uh, and, and accomplishes a lot of uh, things. Part of it has to do with our seniority. We, we have been there a while. We have great committee picks. We right. have chairmanships. So we're able to get things done out here, even though we're small in numbers, we're powerful in force. And so we can work together and do that. And I think right. that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see some of that unification. Your, your body, Chairman Perry, was quite vocal about its dissatisfaction with the House, displeasure with the House. And your presiding officer, our lieutenant governor, pulled no punches in talking about the speaker. What's going to be different next time? It's mutual, though. It was, it, you may not have seen it public every day. But that internal rip was very, very much. So what's going to be different next time? Uh, well, we're going to have a different speaker, for one. So the whole thing is going to be this. The whole no, thing is the speaker? No, I think, I think that here's the deal. We have a two-party system for a reason. Okay? And I can tell you pretty much everybody Well, the, I know, but the two parties at the but, moment are the moderate Republicans and the conservative Republicans. Correct. <laughs> but I think that the next speaker will be a little more right, I'm guessing, or at least a little more open. Right. And if you, if you allow... If you allow that, that party, and, you know, Dems will be majority one day, too. I mean, it's just the politics of the day, but there was a suppression of the Republican Party inside of that chamber to the point that it bowled over last night. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that, that, that the Speaker suppressed the Republican Party inside your chamber? Look, there was things I would have liked to have voted on that we didn't get a chance to vote on, but, you know, I have always maintained there were some good things. I look at the positive, right? We talked about CPS reform, which I don't think would have happened without the speaker. There was some really good things for rural schools, and there were some yeah. positives, and I'd rather focus on those. But you asked me after special session, there were bills I would have liked to have had a chance to vote on. Same. 
I agree. Yeah, okay. Right over here. Sir. In, in November, we have an expansion of uh, home equity lending, apparently, on the, on the constitutional amendments. And uh, uh, with that coming up uh, and understanding that uh, homestead protections uh, protect us from the tort lawyers and what have you, what, is there an impediment to increasing rural homestead designations uh, from 100 for single, 200 for married, up to like 1,000 for single and 2,000 for married? That's a very specific question that I'm going to let you fine elected officials answer. <laughs> Yeah, so you're talking about the ability to, you know, so you're, so homestead protections, I mean, Texas is one of the most debtor-friendly states because of probably how historically we've been founded. You can't get after a homestead exemption if there's a civil judgment against you. I assume that's what you're talking about? Yes, sir, you can't make a living on 200 acres anymore, right? Yeah, so, you know, nope. So what happens if somebody gets a civil judgment against you, they can go foreclose on all of your property, save and accept what is considered or designated your homestead. For those of you not following the conversation, there's a specific for rural homestead exemption, which is, I believe, 200 acres currently today. And the question is, should we expand it, given that it takes more acreage to actually produce on a farm? Did I get the question right? Yes, sir. It's good. And it's a constitutional amendment. So now that I've got the question right, let me answer you. The first one to bring it up to me, I like the idea. I, I, you know, I think it merits some serious consideration. I think, I think that's the one of the seven that anybody's heard me speak to it. That's the one that everybody in this room needs to understand. It's a monumental shift from where Texas believes Homestead is to where it will be afterwards. I, a little bit libertarian streak, would say it's not my job to be able to manage your equity in your personal home. So you're a, you're a no vote on that constitution? No, I'm, I'm okay with it. I you just are. tell everybody this is a different Texas if that's in, and I think it will go through. But you're voting for it anyway. I vote for it because I don't think I should be in control of someone's home equity. And I'll give you a good example. One of my town halls, son had cancer, $25,000 bill. They're setting on equity in their home. Guy had to leverage his first born to get that cancer treatment. She said, if I could have got twenty-five grand out of my house, I got more value, I right. would have been able to cover that. So I'm just telling everybody that's voting on that just to philosophically understand that is a departure from where Texas has been, but we would be in line with the majority of the state. Got it. But you can lose your home if you go down this road, where in Texas you, it's hard, you can't really lose it today. Other so. questions? I'm going to go to this side of the room if I can, if there's a hand, or I'll go back over here. Let me go to that one over there, Jessica, and then we'll come over here. Ma'am. Hi, yes, Amanda Smith. I am a constituent of Lubbock, Texas. And thank you all for coming tonight, today. Um, as conservatives and what I consider pro-business representatives, would you be open to considering scaling back occupational licensing, which I believe is an overreach? if that comes up this legislative session. Well, I think one of the best things you can look at is what we've done the last couple of sessions. Well, you're on this committee. I mean, this is specifically well, work you've last done. Session, yeah, even right. we reduced a lot of those fees, eliminated the fees, and uh, I think that that's a general trend and that's a, a good conservative thing. It's, uh, uh, we've also went ahead and uh, made it to where like in the insurance profession where they can align the dates so they can all come due at one point rather than missing them or trying to catch up. We, right. Uh, made the hours that we require as a state uh, more consistent with national organizations. Again, make that easier for the different professions to uh, uh, participate in. So and I'd, we've I'd, done a lot I'd of that. I'd add to that that the state would get rid of them all, I believe, but those are all association driven. For example, as drug culture has infiltrated our, our workforce, especially traits comes to mind, like a heating and air guy or a master plumber, someone that would be in your residence. Their association has said, we want background checks. Well, now they're getting to a point where the workforce is shrinking to where the background check is producing someone they can't hire, even though they're licensed, qualified, right. and what they're not able to do was something they did 20 years prior. So you think this is no the instance. lobby? The lobby is so, doing this? No, no, it's the associations. It's the Heating and Air Association. It's well, all of those associations that said... We're calling them by different names, so, but we're talking but, about basically yeah, the same thing. But, but my point is, is yeah. we would remove those barriers to entry... Right. But it's the associations that are self-policing right. 
tells us to do that. But, but it, we it, have it, gotten better, like check the box, non-disclosure. Yeah, right. So an employer doesn't have to know if it was something that was non-violent in your past right. so you can find gainful employment going forward. It's redemptive. You the push, the pushback it, represented so. Burroughs is occasionally that what you're gaining at the benefit of the reducing the burden on occupations you may be losing in consumer protection area. Public safety. Yeah, yeah public but I mean, safety. look, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. If we're talking about interior designers, they do not need a occupational right. license. I mean, you do not need to be licensed to figure out where to put somebody's shampooers. couch. Shampooers. You I have mean, to have a license to shampoo. Yeah, there's a lot of things I think that we should be looking at and really doing the deep dive in to figure out where it is, but it's probably not a case. It's a case-by-case -case basis, not let's get rid of all of them overnight. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Gentlemen back here, sir. As we continue to see uh, health care cost increase, uh, especially the, the cost of services and so on, what, what do we do as employers and yeah. uh, to, to come back? And I, I don't know you can do anything in the state, I don't know, but certainly the government taking over is not the answer because that doesn't work. But, but what do you guys think about that? Well, this is a con well, this this could take up two hours of our no, of our conversation. Really but what we know is that the state budget this time, health care is the highest percentage it's been, I believe, ever. Health human services right. takes off, and inside of the right. state budget, health care for retired teachers, right, two billion dollar number next day. These are hockey sticking costs. And and but the way we have to have federal reform. If we don't get federal reform, the state and every state in the union is going to be faced with service reduction or revenue enhancement. Point blank in the next two to four sessions. Our, our trajectory on indigent care through Medicaid, our trajectory on health care for our state employees, and health care for the average consumer's household is going to overtake their budgets. And we have to have federal reforms to put it in place. Can, can you ensure that the people who have not because the state embraced Medicaid reform, but despite the fact that the state didn't, the percentage of uninsured Texans has dropped over the last seven years by about 1.4 million. Can you ensure that any kind of reform that Texas would support would not throw those people off of insurance again? Absolutely. Yeah, what, so, what, so what does such a reform look like? So if you got the federal reforms where you can manage the Medicaid dollars, you get your, you get, first of all, Medicaid needs to go away. It needs to be an all one system. We're, we're managing Medicare and Medicaid. The a bureaucracy alone to manage a two-tier. Do you want to see Medicaid eliminated as part of as part of a reform? Make it a Medicare system. Right. Eliminate the bureaucracy. Roll those things up into privatization of a Medicaid payment where you get some reinsurance value as you do in the private sector. Expand your high risk pool to catastrophic and chronic, and then put the consumer, as Dustin's advocated very very That's properly, consumer in charge of his health care decisions by giving him access to pricing with quality metrics so that the doctors know that you know that their competitor two doors down will do it for half the price. You sound like you want to get into this. Yeah, I do. This I think this ought to be the, one of the biggest issues that nobody is talking about but should. It is the biggest item that most people pay in their households is for health insurance. Number one item. They, Kaiser says by 2019, the average price of insurance for a family force can be somewhere between $22,000 and $30,000 a year for a household. People cannot afford it. 1960, 4% of the economy was spent on this sector. Today, it's almost 18%. It's heading to 20%, 22%. We as the state can't afford it. Individuals can't afford it. So we have to start thinking outside the box about big things we can do. It'll free up money at the state for schools, for property tax relief, and all the other things that we ran on you know, for higher education that we want to actually do. So putting the consumer in charge, letting markets work, is what I've continued to advocate for. It starts with price transparency, plan benefit designs. We actually give people incentives to shop around. There are things that we can do. There's a lot of good ideas. We just have to have the political will to do it and to sometimes battle against a lot of really deep pocket money interests who don't want to see reform. And you can't do any of that now at the state level without the feds no. acting first. Absolutely. No, what actually, do you do I, can, about, I can do it all yeah. at the state level. I just need the political will for people to get behind doing it. What do you do about pre-existing conditions? If they uh, overturn, repeal the Affordable so, Care Act, what do you do about you, that? You're talking about health insurance. I'm talking about cost, which is actually what drives the cost so of health insurance. So you don't think that the reform question begins with the insurance and the federal health reform no, question? that's where we have it all wrong. So then why can't, if you, if you all can do that without the federal government acting, why haven't you done it? I filed the bills to do it. But, but but you're a conservative Republican in a overwhelming majority Republican House with an overwhelming majority Republican Senate. Who's preventing you from doing Can it? Can I tell you how frustrated I am by it? Yeah, I've please. Got, yeah. Go I've right got, ahead. I have the ideas. I've put them yeah. on paper. I've asked for more people to come in and actually work on them. They are the right ideas. Unfortunately, there are people on the other side that have money interests who don't which, want these which, ideas heard. Which other side? You take a look at lobbied interests. The consumers need to get behind 
true cost reform. So the lobby, is, the lobby is blocking the reform you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you what, nobody's actually put their uh, fingerprints completely on it, but my guess is the people who make all the money on the other side of it don't want new innovative ideas to come through because 17% of the economy, that doesn't do them any harm. It would stand to reason that they would have an interest in not seeing change. Anybody over there? Any more? We have time maybe for one more. Let's do one over here. Maybe we have time for two more. I don't know. But I think we have time for one more. We'll take that one and this one, and that'll be it. Sir. From the 1960s and intensified during the Reagan years, the party position has been so much against the, the problems of the national federal debt and every year's deficit that adds to that. Yes. And the, I think the most recent snapshot is $666 billion added in the latest fiscal period. When Harvey hit Texas, creating a huge problem and a need for money, uh, the requests were made to the federal government and special bills to provide money and good money to help our people here in Texas, but it does increase the national deficit. We in Texas have a rainy day fund that's multi-billions dollars that maybe could have been diverted to help some of the Texans faster, quicker with Texas money for Texas people and not help increase the national debt. Why didn't the governor and the legislature move to provide some of that money to uh, help Texans. So, Let's stipulate that so, the cost of the relief effort is going to be more than $200 billion. All we're going to have in the rainy day fund, most optimistically, is about 11 or $12 billion, so, right? So, there, yeah, bottom line is you need to have a reserve. We're a $217 billion enterprise. We're eighth the tenth largest economy in the world, and we don't even have a 20-day reserve with $11 billion in the rainy day. So you've got to have some flex. But I was there in 11. We wrote a $3.1 billion check out of the rainy day to keep from bouncing check at the state level. So the reserve is there. It's there for a reason. And we are going to use it for Harvey relief in 19. But on the back end, not on the front end. But, right? but here, well, a couple of things. Number one, understand that all of the money for Harvey is going to be 90% federal, 10% local and state. I do think that the state will be asked to partner with the locals to get that 10% match. That would be a rainy day allocation, probably, because right. we don't have it in the budget. But his concern is that the 90% is going to raise the federal deficit, right? Well, yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. That's a different debate and a different discussion. It comes down to what we're facing, entitlement, Medicaid. Those reforms have to take or we're going to broke. That didn't change with Harvey. But on Harvey's relief, when we go back, public school finance being what it is, if the values are down, state's portion goes up. Values go up, state's portion goes down. We are going to have a decrease in values specifically to that region. The state will have to write that. It'll be somewhere between 500 up to 2 billion is what we're told. 500 million up to 2 billion to level, stabilize the public school finance system that we currently have, and that will be rainy day transfer. I do think the state will have to be considerate of the fact that a lot of these municipalities do not have 10% match right. to, to match the $100 million project. So the state may be looked to in an evergreen, because here's the other side. Feds are going to fund 90% of it, but it's a reimbursement kind of deal. You front load it, and then five years, FEMA and uh, government tend to send your money back. So the state's going to have to bridge that. So that's where the rainy day allocation will be, and I fully anticipate. Yeah. I have not heard a single statewide say differently that we will tap it for those reasons. Yeah. The estate also, most people do not realize, we subsidize windstorm energy uh, uh, insurance down on that coast. So we still don't know what the cost of that subsidy is going to look like. We were out $3 billion on Ike. Is that what the final the large, is? The large number, whatever so it was, right. the state has responsibilities that are not fixing the roof of the homeowner because private insurance and federal and other monies do that. But our backstop is public school finance, probably some local and county match, and then TWIA, whatever that number is. Representative Frilly, you can understand that we have a rainy day fund and it rained. And that the optics of this out in the state is if you're not going to use this money for this, why even have it? Right. I think part of it is, as Charles said, it, it, it is to use for items. And I think that, uh, as he also said, it will be used for these items. The problem is I'm not willing to run out there with the state's checkbook and start writing checks and spending all these folks' money for something that we may or may not have reimbursed by somebody right. else. There's a lot we don't know right now. It may right? or yeah. may not be in it's going to take reimbursed through insurance. You know, uh, 2000, uh, what was it, 2011, we passed the TRIA yeah. reform. So there was a lot of changes there that happened. This is the first big event that has happened since then. How will those work? There's a lot of things that we don't know. And the first answer is not to sit there and get right. out of people's tax dollars and write checks. Unaccountable. Um, we've got a last one right here before we go. Um, Jess, you've got a microphone there. Sir. There we go. Yes. Uh, T.G. Caraway, I'm a resident here in Lubbock. Uh, we've talked about um, 
a lot of the school finance and stuff and talking about property tax. And I think we know 20 years ago, the state was putting approximately, what, 60% in back into public schools, and now it's right at 38%. I mean, there's where the tax problem lies on our local taxes. I mean, they're having to pay more taxes to cover the schools. I mean, what what are we going to do about right. that? That's where the problem lies. We need tax reform right. in Austin Rep to get this money back. It, it, it's undeniable that the state is funding less of the public education burden today than it did once upon a time, and that property taxes as a consequence of that for a lot of people are going up. Sure, but you've got to go find the money tree in Austin to figure out how to change the equation. I mean, it was set up to actually have this up and down and balance and flow yeah. between the local and the state. So everybody who brings that point up, fair, it is a true statement. You can actually point to the numbers and verify that's the case. But where are you going to get the money to equalize it, and why is, is that actually a better way to do it? Typically, when I hear that, I think people are trying to advocate for a new tax, like an income tax, which I am completely against. And so that's usually what I hear. But, you know, if there's another solution, let me know where that money's coming from. So in the absence of new money for public education, the system is likely to stay roughly where it is right now. Depends. Depends on what? The economy well, of Texas. Well, the, the flip side of the argument is the state's benefited from an increase in value because of the Texas miracle. Well, that value will recede. And when it does, the state will be expected to step up and write the check to balance the difference. So this is how it is now, but it may not be how it is over time. This is how it is now. I right. mean, we, we balance out. It's a teeter totter. Got it. Okay. How it is now is that we're unfortunately out of time. Yep. Uh, <laughs> these, uh, these guys have done a great job in, uh, in taking these questions. Give them a big hand. Burroughs, Trullo, and Perry. Thank you to the president. Thank you to Tech. Thank you all for coming. We'll be back. We appreciate you. Thanks very much. Hey, really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Oh, I didn't grab your tie.